Good day, everyone. Welcome to the Psychedelic Support Speaker Series. I'm Dr. Allison Fiducia, a neuropharmacologist and co-founder of Psychedelic Support. And before we start, I'd just like to direct you to some links that are at the top of the chat. We have uh, continuing education courses on our website where you can earn credit with CE and CME, as well as certificate training programs. And there's some uh, new cohorts that are starting in July for ketamine, assisted therapy for clinicians, as well as IPI's uh, full year training. Erica also is gonna tell us a little bit about Inner Trek, and she has a course as well on scienceofpsychedelics.com. Uh, so you can hear more from her at uh, that during those courses. And so today we're, we're hosting a really important discussion with Dr. Erica Zelfend to better understand what we know about concomitant use of psilocybin with medications, specifically antidepressants. There has been very little controlled research looking at the potential mechanism in medication interactions with psychedelic substances, but we do have information for mechanistic studies as well as anecdotal reports from people using psilocybin in non-medical contexts. And when we talk about drug-drug interactions, we really need to think about the potential toxicity and safety concerns. But also as psilocybin is moving more towards clinical use, you know, how might different types of medications interfere with a the therapeutic response? And so today we have uh, Dr. Erica Zelfend here. She's a licensed family doctor, ketamine provider, and psychedelic facilitator. She specializes in functional med medicine and integrative mental health. And she's been a member of the Psychedelic Support Network for many years. So it's really exciting to have her come speak with us today on this topic that I know a lot of people have questions about. We will hear a presentation from Erica and then at the end we'll do a QA. Uh, so I will ask at the end for people to drop in their questions to the chat and then I'll select some uh, for her to respond to. We will record the video and post it to our speaker series page and also YouTube. Uh, if you give us a few days, the, the video, will be, video will be available there. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Erica and uh, we'll get started here. Hello, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining and what a beautiful turnout. Um, I know you're not all just here for me, although I, <laughs> I am delighted to be here. This topic is really at the top of a lot of people's priority lists to learn about, because as you know, we are finding ourselves in the throes of a mental health crisis. Mental health is, I'm referring it to mental health as the other pandemic that we're in right now. Um, I myself started out as a primary care provider in Oregon. And I had a, a thought on what my practice was going to be. And it actually ended up being something quite different because I realized uh, that an overwhelming number of my patients really needed support with mental health. And so we have all this information now about psilocybin and how psilocybin can support mental health. And in the meantime, we also have this long history of using pharmaceutical medications to support people with their mental health. So how do the two go together? Can they? Yes. And let's take a look at some of the science behind that. And then um, I'm going to go on one or two soapboxes just to warn you that's going to happen too. You're going to be, I, I have this mug that says everyone is entitled to my opinion. And so you're, you're going to get that today as well too. Um, Allie, let me know, does, is this coming up on your end? Okay. My slides. I cannot hear you, you're muted. Okay, I'm getting a thumbs up. Okay, so hold on to your hats, cowboys and cowgirls and others, here we go. So as mentioned earlier, I'm Dr. Erica Zelfand. I'm a family doc and I specialize in integrative and functional medicine. Uh, in particular, in the last few years that has really shifted to a focus on integrative mental health as well as psychedelics and weaving those into uh, people's physical and mental health as well. So a quick disclaimer, okay, psychedelics are not legal in many parts of the world. We have a lot of data and we need more. So the information that is contained in this presentation is 
what to the best of my knowledge, what the case is, but uh, it's obviously not the full story. And I'm not condoning any illegal activity and I'm not your doctor unless we've already established a doctor-patient relationship. So to start out, I'd like to talk about Jennifer and all of the cases, by the way, that I'm going to be presenting today are cases of actual patients or clients of mine. Um, names, gender, certain other details have been changed just to protect people's privacy, but the, the meat and potatoes are real. So Jennifer is a 52 year old woman with chronic depression, anxiety, and sleep disturbance. And her social history is significant for a rough childhood. Her, she had a father in the military, so they moved around a lot as a family. Um, she went to a lot of different schools, had a lot of different friends that she had to say hello and goodbye to. And uh, when I came to know Jennifer, she was on three different psych medications and she had been medicated for over a decade. She was on aripiprazole, which is Abilify in the States, uh, Trintelix and Bupropion, which is Wellbutrin. And she had been on a waiting list to come to a psilocybin retreat and there was a cancellation. She got a call, hey, do you wanna come to the retreats in 10 days? She said, absolutely, yes. And she cold turkey stopped all three of her medications 10 days before the retreat. And during the psilocybin retreat, she did great. She had a great experience. She had little to no withdrawal symptoms. She tolerated the mushrooms very well. And after one of her experiences, she actually was able to access a repressed memory and she realized she had been molested as a child. And she, in this very safe, very strong container of the retreat, was able to actually process that memory, work through it, um, and start the healing journey around it. And when she left the retreat, she left feeling very optimistic and like some big shifts had happened for her. But within a week of getting home, she entered a major crisis point. She had a huge flare of her anxiety, big flare of sadness. She had difficulty focusing, her brain fog was pretty severe. And this is what clued me into something that this, there was something more than just psychological or emotional happening here. She was having difficulty tracking with her eyes when she was reading. She told me that she was barely functioning and her exact words were, I feel like everything that happened in Jamaica was for nothing. So what Jennifer was experiencing was antidepressant withdrawal reaction. She was going through withdrawal from these powerful drugs she had been on for over a decade. So I advised her to go back on at least one of her medications and she chose to go back on the aripiprazole or the Abilify, stabilize on that medication for a minimum of six months and then we'll talk about tapering her down. In the meantime, that gives me six months as her healthcare provider to optimize the conditions for health so that her success is going to be as good as possible once she does get off her medication. So I've asked her care provider have at least six months to optimize her hormone levels. This is a postmenopausal woman to optimize her gut health, optimize her nutritional status and get her ready. Now she wants to do more psilocybin, but we need to get her stable on her medication again for at least four to six weeks before we can start digging into the psycho-spiritual elements. We need to stabilize her chemistry. All right, so let's take a look at serotonin because serotonin is the focus of a lot of our understanding on how psychedelics work and how the most commonly prescribed antidepressant medications work. So serotonin, also known as 5-hydroxytryptamine or 5-HT for short, is a chemical messenger that carries signals between nerve cells. And serotonin has many physiological effects. So a lot of us know serotonin as the happy neurotransmitter or the happy chemical. And yes, serotonin affects mood, but it also affects memory. And that is part of why when we see people take MDMA or psilocybin or other serotonergic psychedelics, they're often able to remember things that may have been buried or foggy before. Serotonin can also help with neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to rewire itself. Serotonin regulates sleep. This is part of why people with depression don't sleep well. Serotonin also regulates eating. This is part of why people with depression sometimes overeat or don't want to eat at all, or why certain antidepressants make people have an increased appetite. 
Serotonin regulates our cognition, our ability to use our brains to focus and learn. It even regulates temperature in our bodies and stress response. Okay, so pop quiz. Does anyone know where 90 to 95% of the serotonin in our bodies is produced within our bodies? The gut. The gut. The gut. Most of our serotonin in our bodies is made in the gut. And that is why what you eat matters. What you eat can be medicine or what you eat can be poison for your brain. This is why the balance of microbes in the gut matters. This is why probiotics have been studied to help with depression and neurological conditions. This is why antibiotics can do harm to our mental health. They disrupt that microbiome balance. This is also why reflux medications can do harm. A lot of people are living on a meprazole on their little purple pill on their Tums. You're not doing your brain any favors when you take those drugs. And also gastrointestinal infections. Anything that's going to upset the gut can do harm to our moods. So let's take a, a zero in and focus now on how the cells of the nervous system actually use serotonin to communicate. So the neuron is a nerve cell. This is the fundamental unit of the brain and the nervous system. And nerve cells use chemical signals and electrical impulses to receive sensory input and send input, whether it's from the external world or to communicate with other cells within the brain, other parts of the nervous system, other parts of the body, or to tell the body, I need you to wiggle your left pinky finger now. And the communication between nerve cells happens at what's called the synapse. So each neur neuron has these little finger-like projections that reach out and talk to the next nerve cell in line. And the space in which that communication happens is called the synapse. We're gonna take a closer look now at a synapse. So this is one of the finger-like projections of the sending neuron or the presynaptic neuron. And here is our receiving or postsynaptic neuron. So serotonin gets released from the presynaptic neuron. Serotonin hangs out in this synapse. And then the postsynaptic neuron has its arms wide open, stretched out, ready to receive that serotonin, take it in, and work with that signal. Now, to be an efficient system and to prevent overstimulation, the sending neuron, the presynaptic neuron, has a serotonin reuptake channel. So after serotonin has been hanging out in this synapse, the sending neuron can actually suck some of that serotonin back up into itself, hold on to it, and use it next time. So we're going to focus on SSRIs for a lot of this talk, although I won't mention some of these other drug classes. SSRIs are the most commonly prescribed class of antidepressants. You've probably heard some of these names, citalopram, escitalopram, fluoxetine, fluvoxamine, et cetera, et cetera. We also have serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. So these affect not just serotonin, but also a stimulating neurotransmitter called norepinephrine. Um, personally, as a prescriber, this is my favorite class to prescribe. Um, and we have our partial agonist reuptake inhibitors. And a lot of you folks may be familiar with bupropion or Wellbutrin as the brand name goes in the States. This actually does not affect serotonin at all. It affects dopamine and norepinephrine. These are our catecholamines. These are stimulating or arousing, not in a sexual way, although it can be that, that too, uh, arousing to the nervous system um, antidepressants. I think Elon Musk recently said that this medication was more harmful than Adderall and needs to be removed from the market. Uh, as someone who prescribes bupropion, I'm just going to go ahead and disagree with him, but you know, he's allowed to his opinion on his platform that he owns. <laughs> so let's talk about serotonin, the neurotransmitter I just introduced you to and how the SSRI medications work. So in a normal brain, and if you're on medication, I'm not saying you're abnormal. It's just normal, meaning unmedicated brain. As I just said, the serotonin gets sucked back up by this serotonin reuptake channel on the presynaptic neuron. So the way in which SSRIs work is they block this reuptake channel. 
So here we have the medication is represented in green. It's essentially putting a, that's like rolling a rock in front of a doorway. And so that serotonin cannot get sucked back up into the sending neuron. It hangs out in the synapse longer. That makes more serotonin available for the postsynaptic neuron. And then we have improved message transmission. So that's one way that SSRIs work. We're gonna focus now on another mechanism in which SSRIs and psychedelics both work. And that is through mediating inflammation. So we know that there is a connection between inflammation and depression. We know from several studies that those with depression tend to have higher inflammatory levels. Now, does the depression cause the high inflammation or does the high inflammation cause the depression? Yes. There is an advantage to inflammation causing a depression. Our bodies are very smart. They do the best they can with the information they have available. So once upon a time before we were constantly doom scrolling on our phones and eating processed sugar and eating foods that our bodies don't even realize are food because they are so processed that they don't even resemble food, et cetera, et cetera. Once upon a time when life was simpler, we experienced difficult things in life. We would get infections, for example, the flu. Uh, or we would experience injuries, for example, a broken leg. We still get those things now too, right? So our bodies respond to these insults by throwing inflammation. And inflammation in the acute phase is actually very healing. It's part of how our bodies heal. Inflammation helps recruit, repair cells and immune cells and bring them to the areas in which they are needed. So in the case of someone with the flu, inflammation actually helps the body mount an immune response to fight the virus. In the case of a broken leg, inflammation brings all of those repair cells to the site of the break so that it can knit together and heal more quickly. And so what would happen is as a side effect of this inflammation, that inflammation would then go and irritate the brain and the individual would not feel so good. They'd wanna just like stay at home, lie down, not walk around, not leave the house, not run errands, not go to the party. And what that would do in the case of infectious disease is it would prevent that individual from going and spreading the infection to the rest of their community. In the case of injury, it would force the person to rest so that they're not walking around on an injured limb, compounding the injury, so that they would stay at home, put up their foot, do the early life equivalent of watching Netflix, and so that their broken limb could heal. And so depression was actually something that helped us heal. Nowadays, however, we have a kind of lifestyle that drives low-grade inflammation all the time, irritating our brains. And the depression we have now may or may not, I would argue may not actually be in our interest as a species. So with unchecked inflammation, especially that mediated by tumor necrosis factor alpha for you docs out there, is we have mental health conditions. We have depression, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's disease. Number, this is not an exhaustive list by any means. We also have physical health conditions, atherosclerosis. If you have clogged up arteries, if you're a heart attack waiting to happen, you probably have high levels of inflammation. Rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, type two diabetes. A lot of the conditions that are actually quite common in the developed world right now are at least in part mediated by inflammation. Fortunately, both SSRIs and psilocybin have anti-inflammatory effects. So in fact, a lot of people, when we talk about SSRIs, we really harp on the serotonin piece, but part of how SSRIs work is also by their anti-inflammatory effects. Now, fortunately, we don't need to use SSRIs to get anti-inflammatory effects. We have a wide variety of interventions that can reduce inflammation, but it's sort of a, a double punch with the SSRIs. Uh, psilocybin also has an anti-inflammatory effects. This may be why microdosing helps with depression. So looking at another factor here, let's talk about neuroplasticity. Um, and I would ask, unless your name is Erica Zelfand, please mute yourself. I'm feeling a little distracted right now by somebody's breathing. Thank you. 
Uh, so neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity refers to the brain's ability to rewire itself, the brain's ability to adapt and change and compensate in response to new situations, to things that we encounter as an organism. Um, and it's our brain's ability to actually grow new neural networks, to sprout healthy nerve endings, to reorganize itself, to form new connections. And surprise, surprise, neuroplasticity is modulated by our friend serotonin. And so what we see in individuals with depression and other mood disorders is that we have the opposite of neuroplasticity happening. We actually have atrophy of nervous system cells in the prefrontal cortex in the front of the brain. We have reductions in gray matter of the brain. We have reduced density and reduced size of the brain cells. And we have reduced volume in a part of the brain known as the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain associated with emotions, memory, and our nervous system. So what we know about SSRIs is that SSRIs can actually reverse the gray matter changes that are seen in depression. SSRIs have the exact opposite effect on gray matter as depression does. And SSRIs also support neuroplasticity, the same kind of neuroplasticity that we see in childhood. So people's brains really can work better on SSRIs and other antidepressant medications. Fortunately, psilocybin has similar effects as well, both in vivo and in vitro, meaning in the test tube and in the organism. Research on serotonergic psychedelics shows that they increase neuroplasticity as well through a number of mechanisms, one of which does have to do with serotonin, the 5-HT2A pathway. So what if you don't want to do drugs? No problem. There are many other ways to support neuroplasticity. You do not need to microdose. You do not need to take antidepressant medications. So a lot of people know about doing crossword puzzles and Sudoku and things like that. Yes, that helps. I really want to harp on physical exercise. Okay. I have it in bold and in purple here because when I look in the literature on mechanisms for increasing neuroplasticity, the amount of studies on physical exercise is like it's like drinking from a fire hydrant, the amount of data we have on how much physical exercise helps our nervous systems, mood, brain health. So if you or your patients are struggling with depression and you are not recommending exercise or you're not exercising yourself, you are leaving the best studied, cheapest medicine on the table. Okay, so if you take nothing away from this talk except for one point, it's get up and move your body. And it's going to help with pretty much every other 99 point something percent of other physical ailments to get up and move your body. Sleep is another big one. Sometimes patients come in and they say, what's what medicine are you going to put me on? I'm like, I'm going to put you on sleep. They're like, okay, but what supplements? I'm like, you need to sleep. <laughs> sleep is amazing medicine that uh, Westerners uh, seem to have forgotten about. Um, intermittent fasting as well, making artwork. Um, many botanical medicines can help with this. Um, learning, learning a new language, learning a musical instrument, learning how to juggle, new skills, developing new skills. Um, and also ketamine. Uh, I'm a ketamine prescriber. I've seen ketamine do wonders for my patients as well. But I don't let them touch the ketamine until they're moving their bodies and sleeping because once they do those two things, they might not even need the drugs. All right, so let's compare how psilocybin and SSRIs work a little bit differently at the serotonin receptors in the brain. So there are many different kinds of serotonin receptor subtypes. Uh, you do not need to memorize this list. There's no quiz at the end, but I am gonna focus on two subtypes in particular, the 5-HT1A and the 5-HT2A. So the 5-HT1A receptor, this is the one modulated by SSRI medications. And the 5-HT2A receptor is modulated by psychedelics. We're going to take a closer look at both of these, and they work through slightly different ways. So it's important that we understand the difference between them. So 5-HT1A receptor agonism, this is modulated by SSRIs, by our pharmaceutical medications that affect our serotonin levels. The receptors for 5-HT1A are in the limbic system, that is the part of the brain associated with our stress circuitry. And 5-HT1A receptor agonism or stimulation helps us with coping. 
We don't change, we cope. So we're more resilient, we're more patient. We're able to not have as strong emotional reactions. We're cooler, we're calmer. We're able to put up with more. So as you can see in this photo here, we have a person being splashed by water and she's just taken it <laughs> with, with ease. She's just mm, calm and taking it, right? 5-HT2A receptor agonism is quite different. Here, the individual isn't just taking it. The individual has opened an umbrella. So 5-HT2A receptor agonism helps us with cope. It helps us change. It helps us adapt, learn, unlearn, not just bear it, but work through it. This is the kind of stimulation of serotonin that we see with psilocybin and with many other psychedelics. And these receptors, the 5-HT2A receptors, are not just in the limbic system, but they're throughout the cortex. So we have a lot of these receptors throughout the brain. So there's a difference between how SSRIs work and how psychedelics work. Which one is better? Depends on what you're trying to achieve. Depends on what you're treating. Depends on what stage of life somebody is in. Depends on how ready they are, how much space they have, how much support they have. So SSRIs, just to reiterate, when used alone, I'm not talking about SSRIs plus therapy, just SSRIs, just the drugs, they are tools for coping. They typically don't fix the root cause of somebody's depression, but they can help improve their tolerance for addressing those root causes in other ways. Um, SSRIs help protect individuals against emotional crises or severe states that could cause that person significant harm. And in medicine, my first rule that is in my oath as a doctor is to first do no harm. And sometimes prescribing an antidepressant is first do no harm. Also, antidepressants can help people sleep, which as we said, if you're not sleeping, nothing's gonna get better. And allow individuals to continue with their responsibilities like care for their kids, pay their bills, not end up being homeless, not end up you know, neglecting their children and their responsibilities, et cetera, et cetera. So are antidepressant medications just a crutch? Well, try breaking your leg and then try walking without a crutch, okay? We use this term a lot uh, in medicine and it's very shaming for individuals. What is the purpose of a crutch? The purpose of a crutch is to give an injured area a rest, sparing that injured area from repeat or compound injury. And this is actually an essential part of healing and recovery. And SSRIs can play that role for individuals. So that's okay. Now this argument, if you're on an SSRI, if you're on antidepressant medication, you're bypassing your problems. If you smoke weed, you're not allowed to say that to anybody, period, end of story. If you drink alcohol to help unwind at the end of the day, if you use food to stuff your feeling, if you numb out with Netflix, social media, screen time, if you seek out high risk activity, et cetera, et cetera, we all have the things that we do to help us cope. Coping has its place. Coping can be healing, but hopefully, as a healthcare provider or as somebody who is tuning in to help yourself, you can pair the coping with actively working through in ways that work for you when and how you are ready. So please, please, please do not pill shame anybody who is taking medication that they feel that they need. That's just where they are at in their healing. And part of that has to do with the window of tolerance. So the window of tolerance is a concept developed by Dan Siegel, psychiatrist. And the window of tolerance describes the zone of arousal in which we function the most effectively. So this is the zone in which our nervous system is able to receive and process and integrate information. It's the window in which our nervous system is able to respond to the demands of everyday life without having a meltdown. And it's the zone in which we're actually able to be present and relate to ourselves and relate to others. And what we see in individuals who are struggling with their mental and emotional health 
is that that window is very narrow. There's a really small range of emotions and small range of stimuli that these individuals can experience before they're out of their range. And I'm not talking about a comfort zone here. I'm talking about the nervous system's ability to function, okay? So on the one hand, people can, when they get out of their window, they can respond in a couple of different ways. One way they can respond is with hyper arousal. They can feel anxious, they might get angry, they feel out of control or overwhelmed. And the response is to fight or to run. Another response is hypo arousal. This is where we get spacey, where we zone out, where we feel a little numb, where we might even feel frozen. So this is more of a freeze response. It's a shutdown response. And these responses are not voluntary. This is a very, very smart response that the nervous system has, similar to if you leave your phone sitting out in the sun, your phone overheats, what does it do to protect itself? It shuts itself down. This is very similar. This is adaptive physiology. It's not voluntary. But what is possible is working with a practitioner, doing different kinds of therapy, taking SSRI medications or other antidepressant medications, uh, taking psychedelics, doing all of the beautiful healing tools we have can gradually or sometimes quickly expand somebody's window of tolerance increasing the amount of stimulation that that person can handle and cope with in their life. So as I just said, antidepressants and psychedelics can open that window. Now, caveat here, sometimes what antidepressant medication can do, especially with the catecholamine driving medications like bupropion, is push somebody into hyper arousal. Okay, this is probably why Elon Musk was saying that Wellbutrin maybe more harmful than Adderall. You don't wanna push people into hyper arousal, right? So that's something that I always monitor my patients for. By the way, microdosing can do the same thing. I have seen more than one person push themselves into a manic state by microdosing. So no matter what your medicine is, watch yourself, tell somebody what you're doing, have someone else's set of eyes on you as well, looking out for you. So by mitigating the intensity of negative emotions, might antidepressants allow people to tolerate working through them? I couldn't find anything in the scientific literature on this, but it's my theory that yes, it can. So the way in which I use antidepressants in my practice is once the individual gets chemically stable on the antidepressant, once they feel like they can roll with the punches of life better, once they feel like they can tolerate what's going on, I go, okay, so you're in your window of tolerance now. Healing happens at the edge of the window. It doesn't happen on this edge. It happens on this edge. It happens on the safe side of the edge. So we've just increased the boundaries. Now we can approach the boundaries. Now, can we talk about what happened when you were eight without you dissociating? Now can we talk about the shame that you felt over what happened when you were 24? Now can we talk about how disappointed you are with your career, et cetera, et cetera? So here's a case of Sheila. Again, this is a real person. This is a 72-year-old woman of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. Why do I mention her race and religion, by the way? I mention it because there are certain demographics that are more or less prone to certain types of conditions. Uh, that make them more or less difficult to treat. Ashkenazi Jews are difficult to treat. Um, and I treat them. And there is hope for them. But their cases tend to be a little tougher. So Sheila had and still does have chronic depression. And it ran in her family. Her father and her brother both had severe depression. Her brother actually died by suicide related to the depression. Fortunately, when the vaccine has helped her throughout the years, but after a while, she wasn't really sure if she needed it anymore, wasn't sure if it was helping. And so she didn't love all the side effects of it, so she went off of it. And she was doing relatively okay until her brother died by suicide. That really spun her out. So she decided it was time to help herself. She wanted to get back on the Venlafaxine and she read some articles about psychedelics. 
So she reached out to a retreat center that specialized in psilocybin healing, and she was told that they wouldn't take her on the retreat if she was on the venlafaxine. So she held out. She didn't go back on the medication. Her psilocybin experience on the retreat was very challenging. She actually identified that the depression was, in her words, just anger that is so old it has curdled into sadness and it won't let me go. And so in her psilocybin experience, she could approach that sadness and the anger, but it was like, it was like calcified. She couldn't get to it. It was almost like she needed a jackhammer and she didn't have one. So she actually felt worse after the experience. She felt like there was no hope for her and she wasn't ever going to get better. And in her integration session, she and I worked with the theme of anger. And actually in one such session, um, I actually brought physical objects and a baseball bat for her to break so she could actually move some of that anger. We did some good yelling. We did some good punching, um, a nice discharge of anger. And she felt a lot lighter after doing that work. She debated whether or not to go back on the venlafaxine, and she, but she held out. She decided she was going to try microdosing. And what happened a month later was that she had a severe relapse of depression with suicidal ideation, which was so severe that she actually had to go to the hospital and then was immediately moved to a 30-day residential treatment program. In the program, they put her back on the venlafaxine, and she's now stabilizing on that medication. She's very happy to be back on it. And she wants to do another psilocybin experience, but I have suggested that she get comfortable on the medication first, and then we go back in to do our work. So we do have a head-to-head -head study of an SSRI medication and psilocybin to see which one works better. In this study, uh, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, we had 59 adults with moderate to severe major depressive disorder. Uh, one half took a placebo every day, um, like a fake antidepressant. The other half took s citalopram And then the placebo group got to do two experiences with psilocybin. The s citalopram group had two experiences with placebo with, with a very, very low dose of psilocybin. And the primary outcome was looking at the change in the QIDS SR16 scores. <laughs> and looking at those scores, I hear you cough and mute yourself. <laughs> and I hope you feel better. <laughs> um, patients in both groups actually did well. And s citalopram was about as good at psilocybin in reducing those depression screening scores. So there was a tie. When we looked at secondary outcomes, however, at the other screening inventories, those generally favored the psilocybin. So the psilocybin did better than the s citalopram Okay, but this for me begs the question, I'm someone who likes to have it all, like chocolate or vanilla. I'm like, can I have like one scoop of both? <laughs> Do we have to pick just one? Do we really need to choose one medicine and can't we use all the tools here? So we have one recent clinical trial on what happens when we do combine the two. When patients on an antidepressant take psilocybin, what happens? Does that combination cause problems? And so in this study, oh my gosh, this might look overwhelming, but I'm gonna break it down for you. And I spent forever making this slide. So <laughs> we're gonna talk about it. Is 23 adults between the ages of 24 and 44 were split into two groups. Group A got s citalopram 10 milligrams a day for a week. Then they were stepped up to 20 milligrams a day for a following week. So they were on the s citalopram for two weeks before they got a psilocybin mushroom journey. Group B got two weeks of placebo and then a psilocybin mushroom journey. There was a washout period of two days and then there was a crossover. So group B, their placebo pills got swapped out for s citalopram pills. And group A, their s citalopram pills got swapped out for placebo pills. Another two weeks went by. They did another 25 milligrams of psilocybin. So everybody in this study, group A and group B, did two mushroom journeys. Now, looking at the outcomes, there were some self-rating scales. They measured the autonomic effects, also inventories of the negative effects from the psilocybin. 
Uh, measures of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF levels were measured. These have a lot to do with neuroplasticity. Uh, EKG of the heart electrical activity was measured. And a couple of genes were measured in the blood as well. These are genetic polymorphisms that affect how people respond to SSRIs. Um, and some other measurements having to do with how the body was metabolizing the drugs. And what this study found is that taking escitalopram, the SSRI medication, had no relevant effect on the positive mood effects of psilocybin, meaning all of the good things associated with psilocybin, the folks on the antidepressant medication got to get all the good. Plus, they got less of the bad. Someone's drawn on my slide, Deborah Walton. There were significant reductions in bad drug effects, in anxiety associated with psilocybin, in adverse cardiovascular effects, and things like headache, nausea, fatigue, all of those negative effects were lower in the escitalopram group. Escitalopram did not alter any of the pharmacokinetics of psilocin, which is what psilocybin gets turned into in the body, didn't alter any of the gene expression, did not change the QTC intervals on the EKGs or the circulating BDNF levels before or after psilocybin administration. So in other words, the study authors conclude that stopping escitalopram treatment before psilocybin administration may not be warranted. Escitalopram and psilocybin can be safely administered together. So whoever drew on this slide, um, can you like clean what you did? <laughs> if you can, great. If not, we'll plow ahead. Okay, so some limitations of this study. It's a small study. It's only 23 people. They're all healthy subjects. We can't apply our findings on escitalopram to other SSRI medications, right? This is one drug. And it is one drug. A lot of people on psych meds are on more than one drug. Um, also, this is my biggest critique of the study, is that after two weeks of being on escitalopram, the blood levels of the drug are equivalent to that with long-term chronic use, but people who are on escitalopram are typically on it for longer than two weeks. And there are other changes in the body and in the nervous system that happen with chronic use of SSRIs, and those are not accounted for in this study. So namely, I really wanna harp on the downregulation of serotonin receptors that can happen with chronic SSRI use. We're gonna take a look at that now. We have one little green line here. My type A really wants that gone, but the part of me that meditates and takes psychedelics knows it'll be okay if it doesn't. All right, so thank you. My type A, thanks you. Um, so SSRIs and serotonin receptors. So as we said earlier, SSRIs block this reuptake channel, allowing serotonin to stay in the synapse longer, making more serotonin available to bind on the postsynaptic neuron. What happens over time, however, is the nervous system adapts. So with chronic SSRI use, we actually get a down regulation of these serotonin receptors. So this is our before brain. Look at all of these receptors. Okay. After someone who's been on medication for a while, these receptors are not as sensitive and there aren't as many of them. And even though SSRIs only affect or primarily, I should say, affect 5-HT1A receptor subtypes, this down regulation of receptors isn't just with 5-HT1A serotonin receptors. It's with many other kinds of serotonin receptors. So for that reason, the serotonin neurocircuitry it adapts to accommodate the presence of the drug in the body. And this is why sometimes when I prescribe an SSRI to a patient, they're doing great. But after a month or two, they start backsliding a little bit and we have to up the dose. This is the mechanism at play behind that. And this is also why when people stop their SSRIs, they get withdrawal because the brain doesn't have as many receptors and those receptors aren't as sensitive. This is an adaptation to the drug. Then you take the drug away and you take the drug away faster than the brain can regrow those receptors and increase their sensitivity. 
this is like pulling the rug out from under somebody. That is why abruptly discontinuing a psych med is cruel. Please do not do that to yourself. Please do not do it to your patients. So in short, with an unmedicated brain, somebody not on SSRIs, they take their mushrooms, the mushrooms go through this whole neurological pathway. We have stimulation of the 5-HT2A receptor and we get our trippy psychedelic effects, not just trippy, but also mystical psycho-spiritual. What happens in someone chronically using an SSRI is they don't have as many receptors. They don't have as many 5-HT2A receptors online. So when they eat the mushrooms, there's some stimulation, but not as much. And so we see some effects, but it's not the fireworks that we might see in somebody who's not on medication. So in my own anecdotal evidence, what I have found is that people who have been using SSRIs long-term need higher doses of psilocybin. They need to eat more mushrooms uh, by about 30 to 50% more in terms of their dosage. So for example, if someone not on SSRIs would take three grams, somebody on SSRIs would probably get similar drug effects at four to five grams of mushrooms. So they got to eat more mushrooms. They got to spend more money on the mushrooms. Fortunately, there's no known lethal dose of psilocybin. So we can kind of just go for it. Let's take a look at drug-drug interactions because this is where I think there's a lot of hype and a lot of fear-mongering happening. So a drug-drug interaction refers to a change in the way a substance acts on the body when taken with certain other drugs or supplements or substances. And we talk a lot about serotonin in the combination of psilocybin and SSRIs, uh, but is it really a thing? So causes of serotonin are taking too much of one drug that affects serotonin levels, but more commonly it's the combination of substances that affect serotonin that can cause serotonin syndrome. And serotonin syndrome, it looks a lot like an infection. So person can have a higher body temperature, they might feel nauseous, they might have a headache, their heart rate can go up, maybe they start shivering, they start sweating. Hey, a lot of these are the same symptoms that are absolutely normal during psychedelic states. So how do you know if what you're looking at is a normal trip or serotonin syndrome? One, the context, two, you gotta look out for the red flag sy symptoms. So if someone has a really high fever above 40 degrees Celsius or 104 Fahrenheit, you may have a serotonin syndrome on your hands. If they have a seizure, if they're extremely uh -huh. agitated, um, if they have an arrhythmia, or if their symptoms last longer than how long a trip should normally be lasting. So to avoid serotonin syndrome, you absolutely positively never wanna combine serotonin modulating substances. So that includes a lot of our antidepressants, tramadol, 5-HTP supplements. How often do people take 5-HTP after rolling on Molly? Do not do it, that's a terrible idea. Wait until you're 100% down off of the MDMA, sleep, wait a minimum of 12 hours, then you can take your 5-HTP. And yes, I have treated people who were partying at Burning Man, they took MDMA, they took 5-HTP, they got in harm's way, okay? So please don't combine the two. Um, ayahuasca, by the way, huge serotonin modulator, also inhibits monoamine oxidase. Ayahuasca mixes well with absolutely nothing, nothing, okay? But hey, why isn't psilocybin on this list? It's not on this list. And that wasn't an accidental omission. It's because serotonin toxicity is actually pretty rare with psilocybin. The classic tryptamines like psilocybin, DMT, and LSD, they only partially stimulate the postsynaptic serotonin receptors. And they actually don't increase intrasynaptic serotonin levels, the amount of serotonin in the space between neurons. And they only partially activate the second messenger intracellular signaling pathways. And it's ultimately those secondary messenger signaling pathways that determine serotonin toxicity. So cases of serotonin toxicity with psilocybin are very, very rare. And in the cases that we do have in the scientific literature, they're pri primarily among those people taking monoamine oxidase inhibitors. These are a class of antidepressant medication. They are still prescribed, but really not that common. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors can increase intrasynaptic serotonin levels and therefore can cause serotonin syndrome when combined with psilocybin. 
We also see serotonin toxicity sometimes in people who are taking more than one drug that affects serotonin plus psilocybin. Those cases are even more rare than the monoamine oxidase cases, but they do occur. So just a reminder, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, we don't see them prescribed a whole lot. Um, I almost never prescribe them. I'm trying to think if I've ever prescribed them. I don't know if I have, it's buried. <laughs> so not that common. So uh, in summary, a paper on serotonin toxicity of serotonergic psychedelics, the authors conclude serotonergic psychotropics that do not contain monoamine, monoamine oxidase inhibitors are low risk in combination with psychedelics that also do not contain monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Psilocybin does not contain a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Side note, ayahuasca does. This is why ayahuasca has so many contraindications medically. Okay, discontinuing antidepressants. I'm going to try and move along in a steady clip so we have a little time at the end, so bear with me. But I got to tell you about Roger. Roger's a 38-year-old man who had chronic depression, anxiety, and panic attacks. He was on fluoxetine, which is generic Prozac, and bupropion, which is generic Wellbutrin. He was going through a divorce. And he came to a psilocybin retreat that I was working on. Uh, and in preparation, his doctor said, you can't combine your fluoxetine with psilocybin because you'll get serotonin syndrome. So stop your fluoxetine cold turkey and double up your Wellbutrin. During the retreat, Roger was really angry. He was really argumentative and he was very agitated. He was really engaged in group therapy. He was really eager to heal, but he was kind of like, bringing out the punches. Um, and it was really hard for me as someone on his care team to see the forest for the trees because were these suppressed emotions coming up for healing? Was this an antidepressant withdrawal reaction from getting off of the SSRI? Was this a side effect of doubling the dose of bupropion because bupropion can cause agitation as a side effect? Was it a combination of any of the above? I had no real clue on how to support Roger except to tell him to cut his dose of bupropion in half and go back on his SSRI so that we could compare apples to apples. So the most common mistake that people make when getting off of their psych meds is they taper too quickly. So tapering slowly over several months is much more likely to be successful than tapering over a few weeks. I see this all the time in individuals who come to me and they say, there's an ayahuasca retreat in a month. I'm hell bent on taking ayahuasca can you help me get off of this SSRI in time for my ceremony? And the answer is no, I cannot, because you shouldn't do that. It's a terrible idea. It's a terrible, terrible idea. Here's what I see happen. People taper too fast. They go through horrific withdrawal. They're barely functioning. Then they drag themselves to their ayahuasca retreat. They take the ayahuasca. It's way too much too fast for their nervous system. Um, they go into uh, withdrawal. and Typically, there's some kind of a crisis point, complete unraveling post-ceremony. Um, they need to go back on their meds. And the ayahuasca experience may just actually be registered as a trauma as opposed to something therapeutic. So there's an ayahuasca ceremony in a month and you're on SSRIs. I'm sorry, sweetheart, you're not making it to that ceremony if you know what's good for you. But you could take psilocybin, most likely. So if you want to get off your meds, please work with a healthcare provider. Slow taper is the way to go. Side note on benzos, drugs like Ativan, Xanax, never stop them cold turkey. You can go, you can have a seizure. You can get yourself really into harm's way with those. So quick guidelines for tapering is taper one drug at a time. Aim for about a 10% reduction in your dose every two to three weeks. Um, and if uh, you start recalling your dreams or having more vivid dreams, it means you could taper a little faster than you've been going. Uh, and if you have withdrawal symptoms, um, don't power through them, just taper more slowly. Um, if you're on a drug with a short half-life, like Paxil, consider switching to a drug with a longer half-life to ease the withdrawal. And don't, don't naysay doses less than the therapeutic minimum. So if you're on, let's say, duloxetine, which is Cymbalta, therapeutic dose for depression, 60 milligrams. On your way down, don't just jump from 20 to zero. Play with the spaces in between. Play with 10 milligrams, five milligrams. It'll help your brain ease back, okay? If you need to open the capsules and remove beadlets, do that. If uh, you're a doc, I really 
strongly recommend using a compounding pharmacy to compound medication doses for your patients who are tapering. And lo and behold, the taper is more likely to be successful if the other departments of a person's life are under control, if they've been on the meds at least six months, if they have stable housing, if they have supportive relationships, if they have a good care team, their schedule is reasonable, they're sleeping. Um, I like to taper patients in the spring or summer when there's more sunlight. Um, we're away from the holiday season. Please don't ever taper someone around Christmas or New Year's. Um, if their hormones are in check, their nutritional status, their blood sugar, I have a whole other talk just on how to get people ready to go off of meds. Um, we talk a lot about nutritional status. Quick spoiler alert, if someone's blood sugar isn't balanced or they're anemic, they're not gonna do very well. You've gotta balance those two things and there are other things as well. Um, also, if someone's vegan, it's real tough. I uh, really wanna watch uh, the nutritional status on those folks. So there are a lot of things that cause depression and for most individuals, it's more than one factor. And in the psychedelic world, we harp a lot on the emotional, the spiritual, the ancestral pieces. Psychedelics can help with that. Chemistry is a cause too. Antidepressant medications help with chemistry. What neither of those drugs can do is address nutritional imbalances, hormone imbalances, bad lifestyle habits, poor GI integrity, environmental toxins. Okay, so we really need to consider the whole picture of somebody's health when we're creating the right game plan for them. So I'm gonna close with a case. This is the case of Judy. We're gonna end with a happy one. Judy's 53 years old. She had chronic depression, really, really negative self-talk. She had challenges with her parents. Her father was emotionally abusive and her mom didn't do a good job of protecting Judy and didn't, do, didn't leave the dad, okay? So a lot of stuff to work through there. And she's been on citalopram for a few years and tolerating it really well. So she stayed on her citalopram. Her first dose of mushrooms, we had to go a little higher because she was on citalopram. So I normally would have wanted to give five, but because she was on citalopram, I advised her to take eight grams. She did eight grams. Her second dose, six months later, 10 grams with a little bit of cannabis to help her launch. She did weekly therapy before, between, and after all of her psilocybin experiences. And now Judy's doing really well. She has healthier boundaries with her family. She's actually able to enjoy time with her mother. She's able to stand up and advocate for herself in situations way less trauma triggering. She's also, because she's worked through a lot of these things, found that she could tolerate reducing the dose of her citalopram. She's feeling good and she's feeling strong. So in summary, our anecdotal evidence and at least one clinical trial suggests that it's probably safe to combine psilocybin with SSRIs. Those on SSRIs typically need a higher dose of psilocybin to launch. Fortunately, there's no lethal dose of psilocybin that we know of. Regardless of what tools you're using, you really want to leverage positive influences on the window of tolerance to help people work through their issues. With any person, you always want to address risks and benefits. Tapering needs to be slow and mindful. And this is one of my favorite phrases is use all the tools. Don't be a snob. Use all the tools. We need all the tools. So thanks a lot for tuning in. Uh, as I said at the beginning, I'm Dr. Erica Zelfand. Please visit me at drzelfand.com. My social media handle for everything is at drzelfand. Um, I also have more courses online uh, at scienceofpsychedelics.com. And if you do slash support 20, uh, you'll get 20% off of any of my courses through the end of June. Um, I'm also core faculty at Inner Trek, which is going to be one of the very first state approved trainings for psilocybin facilitators uh, in the United States. I'm based in Oregon where psilocybin uh, is now legal. So uh, if you would like to become a psilocybin facilitator, a legal one licensed above board, um, please visit InterTrek and get your applications in because we're reviewing them right now. Um, so thanks, thanks so much. We're gonna open it up for, for questions now. Hey, thanks so much, Erica. This is such an informative presentation. Appreciate all the insights you provided. We are at time, but I am going to ask you one question uh, mm -hmm. that I hear often. I think I also saw this in the chat is this question around microdosing psilocybin as someone is trying to taper SSRIs. Mm -hmm. Do you have any experience or knowledge on this type of um, 
procedure to mitigate some of the withdrawal symptoms? Uh, it works really well for some folks uh, to microdose. Um, where I'm careful with it is in people who are on, uh, well, SSRI is not so much of an issue, but in folks who are on medications that affect norepinephrine or dopamine, such as bupropion or such as duloxetine, um, microdosing can be very stimulating and those drugs can be stimulating as well. And sometimes pairing the two doesn't go well for people. So as you're going down on the dosage, that's where you, you may be able to, to go up accordingly. Um, but some folks find microdosing really helpful uh, to help them. Yeah, interesting. There's very little research on this topic of yeah. microdosing, particularly mm -hmm. around using it as an aid for withdrawal. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a interesting anecdotal reports we hear. Mm -hmm. And also, I just want to reiterate, um, you spoke a lot about psilocybin, and it's probably safe to do with SSRIs. And oftentimes folks just kind of group all psychedelic compounds together. So it's yeah. really important to remember that each psychedelic has a unique pharmacology and a different risk profile. Absolutely. So they're um, you know, not all one in the same. And I had dropped a really great review from um, Dr. Malcolm, who's also here, that talks about the drug-drug interactions of psychedelics. So do check yeah. that out. It was a really good systematic review that came out and I could drop it in again. I think that's cited in one of my slides, but yeah, yeah. Mad, mad props to Dr. Malcolm and thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Yeah, here we go. I'll put it in again. When we talk about standing on the shoulders of giants, that's definitely <clears throat> one of the giants. So well, as there's more and more psychedelic medica medications coming out, as we think maybe in some years we'll have, you know, it's really going to be sharing of information, the case reports mm -hmm. seems very individualized as well, depending on uh, someone's personal background or how long they've been on these substances. Uh, so I want to continue the conversation. We'll have you back on to as the research advances and, and we hear more about uh, potential risk or what might work well for people or, or not. Yeah, I would love that. As, as James, I once heard James Fadiman say, there are no studies yet, just worldwide use. So <laughs> <laughs> this is why I really do encourage folks to report their data. There are various websites online, especially with respect to microdosing, like microdosing.me and um, Ali, I'm sure you have other resources as well. So if you're if you're experimenting on yourself, please share your findings because that's gonna it's gonna help rise the tide for all of the boats. Um, we want your data, <laughs> not yeah. in a creepy, not in a creepy social media Facebook kind of way, but in a you know what are people finding, what are they experiencing, and how can that help help us help others? Yeah, I think the citizen science is going to have a much bigger role in how we work in this field because you know controlled clinical trials can be very small. They're also funded by pharmaceutical yeah. companies that have specific interests. So it's, that's a it's good to have large data sets across many people that have no other reason to be um, saying something or another besides their own personal um, wanting to report or wanting to share what they've experienced. Mm -hmm. um, sure, sure. Especially yeah. with, you know, a lot of our data on psychedelics by virtue of the primary demographic that has tended to gravitate towards psychedelics has been a, a pretty specific demographic. You know, oftentimes uh, individuals who are middle class, oftentimes people who are Caucasian, often people who are somewhere between the ages of 25 and 50, right? And, and so what do we do? For example, there's this question now of microdosing may have negative effects on the heart, right? And we need to think about that with individuals who are our elders, who are in the more advanced stages of life and want to make sure that we're keeping them safe because we need their wisdom, right? 